It's now time to take a look, look at news stories making headlines around the globe. The hunter turned the hunter yesterday. As security operatives intercepted the acting chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Ibrahim Magu, and took him to the presidential villa Abuja for interrogation by the presidential panel investigating sundry allegations of wrongdoing against him. This day this morning uh, reports different accounts of how Magu found himself at the seat of power yesterday. While one said he was flagged down uh, by security agents as he drove out of his Wusetu annex office and was shepherded to the villa, Another said he was invited to face the panel. Magu's grilling by the presidential panel prompted the People's Democratic Party to ask President Muhammad Buhari administration to show the genuineness of its war against corruption by allowing unhindered investigation of the anti-corruption chief while he steps aside. The embattled the FCC boss was said to have arrived at the State House at 1.40 p.m., where he was ushered into the wing accompanied by one of the EFCC lawyers, Rotimi Jacob. There were initial reports that Magu was arrested by the Department of State Security, but in a statement, the agency refuted the report. Uh, it, was, it was drama yesterday because we did not even know what to believe. At first, we heard the DSS arrested him, that's the Department of State Services. Uh, we also heard the counter report that he wasn't arrested. But what is fact in all of this matter is that Magu is under trial. The question is, will this be Magu's Hides of March? or he will sail through and come out of this stronger. Sundu. Well, that remains to be seen. But yes, well, not trial investigation mm. so far. Let's not jump to trial. Although, from the way things are looking, it might escalate to that point. You never know. Mm. But this whole sort of splitting hairs on whether he was arrested or wasn't arrested or invited, for me, is neither here nor there. Yeah. I would say he was arrested because if you are detained, sort of escorted by security officials, that, for me, is an arrest. You don't need to have handcuffs before you say you were arrested. Yeah. An invitation, you're sent a letter or you receive a phone call, usually a letter, with a date and a time. So this was not an invitation. He was waylaid and arrested. That's just what it is. And like you said, and, no big deal about this. Yes. See what happened to Tafa Balogu in this country. Tafa Balogu, former inspector general of police, he was pulled on the floor and badly treated. So, well, no big I deal mean, about this. No, I didn't, cannot, I didn't say, I didn't say it was no big deal, and yeah. I'm not comparing him to okay. Super Cop, or what was he called there, Robocop, or what was Robocop. he called? Yeah, <laughs> Robocop. No, that's not even what I'm trying to say. Okay. What I'm trying to say is that whether he was invited or arrested, the case, the fact is that he's under investigation. Mm. It might not have been too awful in and of itself, given that he operates or he heads a government department, which must be over sort of supervised mm. by others. You have to be able to justify your actions. What gives it a sinister cast is that recent memo from the attorney general yeah. saying that he's insubordinate, he's, you know, his figures don't quite add up, mm. leveled some quite um, serious allegations. Allegation, so that is what is looking bad. And the investigation, which is where it is now, could sort of escalate into more if it's not properly handled, if it doesn't satisfy well, look, the look, panel. Thomas, you, you wanted to comment on, the, you know, the Tafaba Logan is... No, no, I was saying no, no, there's no comparison. Okay. The yeah. way Tafaba Logan was treated yeah. uh, was untidy, was, was ugly, it was, a... was unacceptable. So we don't need to uh, tie the two together. But I would like to say this, that one, uh, we don't have all the facts yet as to the circumstances of his invitation. Uh, but what we know is that the Department of uh, uh, State Security Services has said he was not arrested and that it was not an arrest and that it was an invitation uh, to appear before the panel that the president set up, uh, led by Justice Ayo Salami, former uh, Justice of the Court of Appeal, to look into the allegations against the uh, chairman of the EFCC by the supervising minister in this case, the Attorney General of the Federation and the Minister of Justice. So what is established, what we can hold on to, is that, yes, uh, he appeared before that panel, and he was uh, given the opportunity to respond to allegations that have been raised against him uh, by his uh, supervising uh, minister. That is what is established. Now, the issues at stake are as follows. One, I think that uh, President Buhari can comfortably uh, take credit in this regard that nobody is above the law. To see the uh, chairman of the anti-corruption agency being invited before a panel to respond to a query shows the seriousness of the administration about the anti-corruption campaign. 
It means that even the chief, uh, uh, the corruption czar himself, the anti-corruption czar himself, uh, is not immune from mm. being invited to ask questions, to give explanations. What are the allegations as put forward by Malami SCN? Uh, some of those allegations are outlined today on the front pages of, the, of many newspapers. They include, you know, opaqueness in terms of recovered assets and how they have been managed. Good reports about, you know, um, monies that were uh, taken back by people and discrepancies uh, therefrom. They also include questions about the lifestyle of the uh, chairman of the ESCC. Oh. So that sends a strong signal to every Nigerian that, look, nobody is immune from being investigated and interrogated. Oh. What we should avoid is trial by media. An allegation is an allegation until it is proven. Oh. And Mr. Magu is entitled to being given the full opportunity to defend himself. And we hope that that panel will give him the opportunity to defend himself fully and with the assistance of his lawyers. The only matter that remains to be added is the protest from the uh, Presidential Advisory Committee or Against Corruption, mm. uh, speaking through Professor Femi Adekunle, who says that this is power play. This is mm. all about power play within the presidency. Mm. And that's an area mm. to which Nigerians okay. may also advise their But there's an issue okay. about judgment. Why is he the anti-corruption okay. uh, with all these albatrosses all hanging this. on all his right, neck? Right. We, we, thanks so much for that. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll have the chair of Rotos, Michael, and Aaron to give us updates on Africa, global business, and COVID-19 updates. Stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Joining us now with Africa Business Update is our ever reliable Rotus Odire. Good morning, Rotus. Over to you. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Tsundu. And good morning, Rufai. Um, so we kick off with uh, the interest rate environment in Nigeria. What actually led me to look at that was um, news that was reported that the central bank had debited a uh, number of commercial banks to the tune of about 118 billion naira uh, on Friday due to a breach, is what is reported in uh, the cash reserve uh, ratio uh, rule. Now, the thing is, um, overnight rates, the rates at which banks lend to each other, I understand it spiked to about 23% and then came down a bit on, on Thursday, came down a bit on Friday, rather, to about 21%. Now, that's while banks lending to each other, 21%. I just said, okay, let's, let's just take a step back and take a look at the interest rate environment. This, you know, NPR, money, the, the, the benchmark interest rate is at 12.5%. Inflation as of May, year on year, is at 12.4. Please keep those figures in mind. If you go to the central bank's website, cbn.gov.ng, and go to their statistics tab, they will give you, there's a list of money market indicators where you get these lending rates. You've got the prime lending rates at 14.92, as at, it goes up to, uh, as at April of this, of this year, 2020, 14.92. The maximum lending rate is 30.73%. Again, as at April. Savings deposits, that's according to the central bank's website, 3.69. However, if you go to any commercial bank, on average, those rates, savings deposit rates, are sub 2%. 364 T bill, uh, as of the last primary auction that took place on six days ago, on the first of this month, was at 3.3%. The 91 day was at 1.7%. The 182 day was at 1.9. Just for the sake of trying to put something up there, I put the 364 day rates almost at least a year, which is what we have. Now, if, if someone was to say, you know, where do I put my money to get some type of growth as far as investing is concerned? I'm honestly not sure what to tell them because your real rate of return, if you subtract those deposit rates from the um, inflation, is negative. Now. What, what, what do we do at this point? Because you've still got an interest rate environment where lending rates are very, very high, but savings and deposits are incredibly low. Can't really blame the banks for all of this. They are operating in an, in a, in an environment where default rates or default risk is high. That's the risk of default. As much as we complain about high interest rates, number of Nigerians default on their loans. Now, um, there's also the fact that cost of doing business is also high as well. And these kind of things contribute to the high rates. Uru Kenyatta in Kenya, he tried to cap interest rates. It didn't work out very well for him. He had to let it go because our market forces are in play. 
Vice President Osibanjo, while he was acting president in 2017, signed two laws, movable asset registry and also a credit reporting law. These two acts were supposed to um, you know, facilitate you know, ease of flexible collateral, which would be allowed to be, to be used for lending, and also credit reporting for agencies to report on you know, folks that are borrowing in order to try to bring rates down. That was 2017. We're halfway through 2020. Not much has changed with regards to the interest rate environment. Uh, PwC released uh, an economic alert um, where they were projecting, we talked about this on the Global Business Report, um, where they were projecting that inflation is still going to continue to remain at double digit levels for the rest of this year. So you have to keep that in mind when you think about your investment options and returns for the rest of this year. Your real rate of return is still, is still, is still negative. There's a chart there where they project, I think they said it's going to be about, they'll average, inflation will average about 12.2% through 2020, it averaged 11.9. That's their thing. I mean, if financial derivatives company, they have a higher um, projection as to where inflation is going to be for the rest of this year. But, you know, I think there needs to be a sustained discussion as to Nigeria's interest rate environment and how there can be more parity between lending rates and savings and, uh, and investment rates. Uh, next up is broadcasting. Uh, the uh, NBC put out a tweet uh, saying that the federal government of Nigeria has granted a 60% debt forgiveness to licensees that are indebted to the, the Broadcasting Commission. Um, and this is in addition to a two-month fee waiver, part of a palliative with regards to the effects of COVID-19 on the broadcasting industry. In order to qualify for this, you have to pay at least 40% of what you owe within the next three months. If not, you don't qualify. Um, uh, I understand that the figure, as far as the amount of radio stations and TV stations that owe money to the federal government is about 7 or 8 billion naira. Um, uh, another thing, pay TV, we're talking about Ebony TV, uh, Ebony Life rather, uh, just uh, yesterday. Pay TV uh, that are indebted do not qualify, so it's only terrestrial stations. But something has to be said about the cost of licenses in a high market like a Lagos or Abuja. Uh, and other markets to, for broadcasting for television and for radio. They're very high. I mean, the amount of money you pay for a license up front is in the millions. And that is before you even get your equipment, which is imported because they're not made here, your camera equipment, microphone, so on and so forth, which you have to import here. And each time there's a devaluation, those items get more expensive. So while this is a welcome, welcome move from the federal government to try to ease what the broadcasting industry is going through, they have to take a further step back and think about how much it costs to get a license and how that eats up your upfront costs before you get your equipment, before you hire your staff, before you start paying taxes, before you start doing everything else. So that is something that has to be uh, looked into. But again, it helps. It's, 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 it's a relief for at least those in the industry who can qualify. Again, you've got to pay 40% up within three months. Uh, next up, we go to Zimbabwe where nurses have been protesting and getting arrested for it over uh, their pay. Uh, nurses in Zimbabwe earn about 3,000 Zimbabwean dollars. They just reintroduced the currency after being dollarized for over a year. The dollarization didn't work out. The peg didn't work out. Inflation, again, I bring up inflation one more time. Nigeria is 12.4%. That's at least respectable when you put it against what Zimbabwe is going through. It's anywhere between 785% to 800%. That's triple digit inflation. So they're asking, if you see those placards, they say no US dollar, no work. They want to be paid in dollars because that's the only way that they can protect their purchasing power and be able to purchase or you know, hold any type of value. And they've been protesting now for the next two days. President uh, Nangawa is his name, the uh, president. He's, he's try, he hiked. Now, um, states pay by 50% about a month or two ago. It's still not enough. They've been protesting in Zimbabwe. They are essentially asking to be paid in dollars. And who can blame them with 800% inflation? It's, it's frankly, it's ridiculous. Um, and finally, Morocco. Uh, Morocco's um, economy is projected. I mean, this is really, you know, for a number of African nations. If you look at the IMF, World Bank, a number of projections, um, their uh, projections for the economy have all been contracted. But Morocco is one of the cases where they're actually saying that, we should have the image up there in a second, but their Q2 um, economic uh, growth is supposed to contract by 4.5%. Q1 is supposed to contract by 13.8%. The first quarter growth for, for Morocco was 0.1%. Yeah, there it is right now. So 0.1% growth, which is almost nothing. It's just flat. 
in Q1 for Morocco. Q2 projected to be 13.8% contraction. Now, for a number of nations, they said, okay, maybe Q3 is when we bounce back, but they are still looking at a contraction of 4.6% in Q3. Full year growth um, is supposed to be contracting about 5.2%. The economy grew by 25 uh, last, uh, last year. So for a number of African nations, if you look at what's going on in South Africa, Morocco, a number of nations, there's still the, 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 what COVID-19 has done to the economies, how they're trying to recover from it. There's still a long way to go as far as recovery is concerned. And that's, uh, that's our update. Well, Rotus, I would just like to comment on a matter of constituency interest, which is the media subject that you brought up. Uh, the decision to uh, have debt forgiveness uh, for radio and television stations up to 60%. This uh, in decision has been taken as part of the uh, outcome of the report submitted by the uh, committee, the Creative Industry Committee, set up by the uh, Minister of Information on COVID-19, and which was led by Atuyota Akwabene, uh, popularly known as Alibaba. I think it's welcome. I agree with you, but I do not think that it goes far enough. I uh, agree. 15 million, 20 million is about the amount you pay for a license. Yes, and then on a yearly basis, you also pay substantial amount. Mm -hmm. Many media houses cannot afford this because mm -hmm. they've been affected by COVID-19. They can't even pay salaries. Advert revenue has plunged. Yeah. Many of them are rationalizing staff. But what we really need and, you know, I hope the Minister of Information will pay attention to this. It's a media intervention fund, which some stakeholders within the media industry are asking for. And that media intervention fund should not just be for the electronic media. It should also cover the uh, print, print, media. print media. You know, uh, within the print media, we have issues with the importation of newsprint. Once upon a time, we used to produce newsprint in this country. Now you have to import newsprint. It drives up costs. And everything that is used in production, uh, in newspaper production, uh, is at a very huge cost. Yeah. Mm. So these are the issues that we face. And I hope that the minister would uh, take a second look mm. at this positive uh, step uh, that he has taken and make sure that it is uh, all uh, embracing. It was so. Thomas Jefferson, I believe, who said that, look, I would rather have newspapers without a government, rather than government without, without newspapers. Analysis. In that statement, it was emphasizing the importance of the media. And it is important for our leaders to begin to see the media as an agent of development, rather than to see it from an adversarial perspective, which is Agreed. what determines well, okay. policy Th initiatives. Thomas Jefferson. Well, Very thank true. you, Rotes. Thank you so much. Thank and you. now for a global business update, we're joined by Michael Wilson from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Uh, we got to China morning, first. Good morning. The, uh, good morning. And the and the the Asian markets and China had a very good day yesterday. Sixth day of a market rise, and it's as if somehow and stocks in Hong Kong paused very slightly for consolidation. But generally speaking, very positive outlook from China. Um, there was a front page editorial um, in something called the China Securities Journal, which has been basically very bullish on stocks. And it suggested it would be good to create a, a positive image in relation to the domestic economy to help shake off the negativity associated with the lockdown. Now, in a sort of command economy, you can actually do that and you can tell people what to think. And that's certainly what happened yesterday. And certainly a lot of people saw that as a sign from Beijing that they were actually signalling to their citizens, all right, let's get over it. Let's get buying the stocks. Let's let's get the old show back on the road. Um, and uh, so that did the job, really. The bullish move on China also drowned out a lot of the health crisis as far as European and US markets were concerned yesterday. US states like Georgia, Arizona, Florida and Texas are still enduring very high levels of cases, but that didn't actually get in front of the bullish mood. I, I'll I'll come to more of that in a moment because I've got some words from the front line on that, as it were. But the Nasdaq, now we're in the United States closed above the 10,600 mark. That's a new record high for that index. Tech giants like Netflix, Amazon and Apple set all-time highs. The runaway success, obviously, of the, that sector has been a, a, quite a sort of uh, a common theme, if you like, in the past few months. But back to the United States and those spikes around. Now, here we have the Atlanta Fed bank chief, a chap called Raphael Bostic, and uh, troubled by data on business openings. The Federal Reserve of Atlanta actually covers a lot of those areas, uh, in including um, 
uh, Florida and also uh, Texas. And, and this is what, what it's actually showing there is that he, he thinks that the recovery is levelling off. So there won't be um, a, a V-shaped recovery. It's actually quite worrying from a, a central member of that very, very important uh, uh, central bank committee. Australia, just a brief nod towards them. They had very good retail sales, as you know, a couple of weeks ago. Its central bank kept rates on hold at um, a quarter of a percent meeting forecast. There is talk that the state of Victoria uh, might move to introduce a four-week uh, lockdown amid a re revised, uh, rising con um, coronavirus cases. Uh, in the UK, so we had um, the China ambassador to London telling the UK that uh, it was in, in, say it was talking about gross interference uh, of making irresponsible remarks over Beijing's imposition of new security legislation in Hong Kong. Britain described what the Chinese are doing in Hong Kong as clear and serious violation of the 1984 joint declaration under which it handed back its colony to China and said London, as you know, would offer three million residents a part of British, and British citizenship. Um, the ambassador said the UK government keeps making irresponsible remarks on Hong Kong affairs. So that's that. That will continue to run. We can talk about Huawei in a moment if you wish. I'll just take you to Germany. Now, Germany is the powerhouse of the, uh, the European economy. Industrial production will rise in the next three months there. That would be an enormous rebound for that economy. The IFO survey, that's one that we sort of look at. It's a private survey, but it's carried out amongst businesses. The IFO Institute, it's called. Um, second biggest increase uh, in industrial production since German reunification 30 years ago. Now, let's go to the dollar and other commodities. The dollar index uh, sold off yesterday. The, bollar, the dollar had actually pushed higher on those US um, non-farm payrolls. Um, but metals received a boost, obviously, because they are actually quoted, as you know, in, in US dollars. So that's made commodities relatively cheaper to buy. Um, the feel-good factor from China was a uh, Good push towards minerals that are used there. They copper, platinum, silver and palladium all saw decent gains. Gold's positive move, slightly more modest. And the oil price, well, that just continues. And as I keep saying, nothing to do with OPEC, nothing to do with the authorities, all to do with demand and storage. And we'll get more updates of that uh, as the week continues. Back to you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I actually wanted to ask you not about China issuing threats, but about Rishi Sunak's statement. What do you think that's going to entail? I'm wondering about the furlough scheme, whether or not it will end in October or be extended. What are your thoughts on that and like suggestions for VAT cuts and state issued vouchers? Right. So no VAT cuts generally, in, in other words, no across the board VAT cuts. Very likely that there may be some sector targeted VA, temporary VAT cuts, like, for example, the hospitality and service industries, which are incredibly uh, important to our economy, as, as they are as they are to yours. As far as generally speaking, there will be certain, there'll be three billion pounds worth of, of green projects announced, because that's the way that that politics has to go. What that has to do with creating jobs, I'm not quite sure, but your point about the furlough scheme is very good. Don't really know. I think we'll wait to see. I'm suspecting that what he would very much like to do is wean people off that because a lot of people have been being paid a sizable proportion of their salaries for not going to work, uh, which is actually quite a nice way to go about things, but uh, not, not if they're worried about what's going to happen when they go back to work. So I think we can see a bit of a weaning off, but also he has to address the rising level of joblessness. Thousands of jobs are being laid off here, and it's very doubtful as to whether those jobs will exist in their present form when all this is over, whenever that may be. Um, it's all down to a, it's all down to something to con to 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 combat the virus, and we are no nearer as far even though drugs companies are working overtime to having a readily available vaccine. That will be the key to all this, and then we'll begin to see things happen. And, and finally, finally on that, just to say a number of people in the city of London, other businesses there, are saying to workers, please come back to work because we miss you at lunchtime, which uh, I can I can appreciate. So can I. <laughs> well, Michael, very quickly before we go, how vulnerable is the uh, UK in the face of the threat by the Chinese ambassador? because it's truly a threat, uh, because it was saying uh, the UK should be aware that uh, uh, what the UK is doing on Hong Kong is a message to other businesses, even beyond Huawei. 
well, it's, it's, it's certainly a message to Huawei, but I think you'll find that Huawei uh, is also finding a similar kind of onslaught from the United States as well. And do remember, as we reported a couple of weeks ago, that China has been desperately trying to create its own um, uh, chips, its own semiconductor chips, which have now been, of course, uh, stopped. Those WorldCom ones have been stopped by the United States sanctions. So there's a lot to go on this. I mean, you, you know, you get a lot of noise before the discussions. Where the, the, these trade talks, such as they are, are very much in the air. And don't forget, one of the most important things which we're going to see is the, the US election in November. That may well alter the whole chessboard as the way this is going on, depending on who actually attains the White House. If it's Trump for a second time, then we can expect more belligerence. If it's Joe Biden, it might be a different story altogether. I don't know that no more than anybody else does, but that I think is going to be absolutely key. The Chinese ambassador can basically say what he likes. It's down to discussions, it's down to trade, and it's down to globalization. And I don't think, I may be wrong, I can't see that China wants to take a back foot on globalization. So there's a lot right. to play for. Right. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Michael thank you so Wilson. Now we're joined by Aaron Akerejada for COVID-19 pandemic update. Good morning, Aaron. Yeah, good morning, Tindu. As usual, always looking easy on the eye, I must say. Thank um, you. Doctor, good morning to you. Aaron, yeah. yeah. one of these is we charge you for sexism. <laughs> I mean, wait, wait, yes. no, Dr. Fancy no, is no, on that. No, yeah. no, no. <laughs> She's on top of that. All right, um, let's get into some of the figures today in terms of the numbers of um, infections in terms of COVID-19 and would actually look at how things are actually playing out around the world. And at the moment, you look at the figures and it states that 11, over 11 million, as a matter of fact, we're getting closer to 12 million people talking about the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19. At the moment, it stands as 11,626,265. But I would like to visit into the U.S., as a matter of fact, because a lot is actually happening in, a lot is actually happening in the U.S. and the numbers keep skyrocketing in the U.S. and the U.S. at the moment are approaching 3 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, and which is quite fearful, understanding the fact that there's been a lot of talks about how, um, easing of lockdown at the same time, wearing a face mask. A lot of things have been politicized in terms of how COVID-19 has been handled in the U.S., and the numbers keep increasing. And disease experts and disease and infectious experts in the U.S., talking about Dr. Anthony Fauci, has been warning that things are not being done right, that if, cautious, if caution is not taken, if precautions are not taken severely, they might have a major wave, that the first wave is not even being handled properly. But let's move away from that because troubling statistics that is actually emerging right now states that you look at the number of infections right now, there are reports actually coming in being backed by scientific data that states that, no, if we go back to the initial slide, because you're going to see these things, and they say that Africa, black, black Americans and Latinos, and moving on to the other slide, black Americans, Latinos are, are three times more successful to contacting coronavirus than any other race in the U.S. So you can actually see, you can see the all figure there, you can see the white, you can see the number of, um, the number of cases for the black and the Latino. And it's quite fearful understanding that this, um, the areas they use, for example, for this particular scientific data had to be the area in Michigan, Grand Rapids in Michigan, and they found out that blacks and Latinos are more susceptible to it and they claim that maybe poverty has a lot to do with this, that this might not just be scientific in its nature. Maybe you said that the biology of the black man or the Latino man, because they found out that blacks and Latinos made up a major part of the essential workers. They were still working when they were locked down, so they came in contact with this thing. As a matter of fact, most of them live in crowded communities, enter crowded buses, go to crowded workspaces, and at the end of the day, they are beginning to see this thing rise. And that is why it is very important that social distancing, and if you cannot do social distancing, ensure that you sanitize, you actually wear a face covering of any kind to minimize infections. And also they found out that deaths were rising in the blacks and Latinos due to the fact that underlying health, um, health, um, health Underlying Conditions. health problems, yes, in, in regards to obesity and diabetes has led to so much death actually happening between the blacks 
and the Latinos. And it's quite fearful. Now, just speaking about COVID-19 uh -huh, and what we are learning on a daily basis, 239 scientists have come out and have spoken and said, and I've warned the WHO to update the, the list and the recommendations in terms of the spread of COVID-19. And at the moment, they are claiming that COVID-19 can be spread through aerosols. That means oh. airborne, that COVID-19 is actually airborne, that unlike what, COVID, what they are saying, that unlike what WHO are still insisting that it is being passed through droplets, but they are saying no, it is even more than that. That is actually, it can be airborne, and, and, insisting, and are insisting that face coverings are a must, and they are almost putting the pressure on the WHO, calling them out as a matter of fact, that they've been slow in acting. When it came to wearing of face masks and face coverings, they were very, very far behind the curve before they decided to push for that. Mm -hmm. And you look at all that, and they're not saying that true scientific data, because 239 scientists came together from 32 countries, and they're insisting that from all that has happened, they found that COVID-19 is airborne, citing major examples left, right, and center. And you look at that, and you say to yourself that this is quite worrisome, and WHO, who are supposed to be our gatekeepers, and more importantly, who are supposed to shine the satellite in terms of how we go about those things, are lacking behind. This is not the Even first time. This is not, this is not the first time, this is not the second time that these things are being, are being put out there. Now, moving forward, before I come to you guys in the studio there, looking mm -hmm. at how things are actually playing out in Africa, it's rather unfortunate that we're seeing COVID-19 in Africa really, really high. And first of all, we spoke about the fact that it took close to 100 days to get the first 100,000 cases. We are not close to 500,000. As a matter of fact, before tomorrow, we will hit the mark of 500,000. And, and there's been talk about the fact that COVID-19 has not ravaged the continent of Africa as was expected or projected. But at the moment, it's beginning to look like it because it took the first 100 days to actually get 100,000 cases. And it took only 18 days to get another 100,000. And it's even taking less of time to get more cases. As a matter of fact, South Africa, alone in the month of June. Right now, South Africa has crossed the 200,000 mark in terms of COVID-19 cases. Alone in June, they were able to, they found and they confirmed 160,000 of those 200,000 cases in South Africa alone. South Africa is really, really having its strong. And still moving on in terms of COVID-19 and how things are actually playing out in Africa, you can actually see the breakdown there. Just yesterday alone, 10,853. And then Egypt coming in in second, 1,774. Then Cameroon, then the Equatorial Guinea, then Nigeria. Mm. All right. So you look at this and you say to yourself that this is quite worrisome in terms of how things are spreading in Africa. And at the moment, we need to be more cautious. That is why reports that are being read about how COVID-19 is being spread should be taken into cognizance and should be adhered to strictly. OK. Uh, Aaron, I've got like two, three questions. Yeah. The first one will be great report by the scientist. But I'd like to ask, how long does this... You know, because even if it's if it's airborne, like they say, yeah. there must be some level of particulate matter in it. How long does this stay in the air for, so yeah. people can know? Now the point All is, right? they are not sure about the the time it's actually. I mean, it actually stays in the air. But what is more important is not how long it stays in the air, but the fact that it is airborne. Because they are even saying that people who are living in close and confined spaces who use air conditioners are more susceptible to having yeah. COVID-19 than any other person. I have known it was airborne. But yeah. your other questions? Yeah. Had... I mean, oh, we need so, to go. Uh, okay, we need to go. We need oh. to go. I've got well, more questions. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, not enough time to address some of the issues you raised, particularly with regard to demographics and COVID-19.